Thanks very much. So my research looks to how we can make our homes more energy efficient. So I'm going to share with you the number one question that I get asked by friends and family. Okay, some of you might have already thought about this question. You might actually currently be thinking about this question right now for your own homes. The question is, should I buy a heat pump? I hope at the end of the talk you'll have enough information to help make that decision for yourself. I also hope that you're going to understand a little bit more about the role that our decisions have and the role that our homes have in the UK's attempts to get to net zero. So, all of our fuel bills have been going up. Yeah? We're all aware, we've all experienced the cost of living crisis over the last few years. For context, the UK government said that in 2021, there was five million homes in fuel poverty. Okay, these are households that spend more than 10% of their income after housing costs on fuel bills. A year later, there were seven million. It's a lot of people. But what are we going to do about this? You know, we're told to go and buy a heat pump. Yeah. We're told to insulate our homes. Yeah, but how are we as consumers, as households, how are we supposed to know how much benefit there is? How are these going to actually help me? It, will they cut my fuel bills? And if so, how much? Is it going to be worth it? You know, are they going to reduce emissions? And, and will it make a difference to climate change? So my research team, we investigate these questions. And I can tell you, the answer to these questions is, sorry, it depends. I know, scientists always say it depends. But let's think about why. Why does it depend? So getting away from fossil fuels to heat and power our homes reduces emissions. It's good for climate change. Having warm homes is good for our health. Great. The problem we've got is that some things that we can do in our homes are better than other things. Yeah. Some things that we do, they have slightly different outcomes. You know? So do you just want to cut emissions? Is that the most important thing? Maybe. Yeah. Or maybe you just want to have a nice warm home that's not going to be damp. Yeah, we all do. Or actually, do you just want to cut your fuel bills, if we're being honest? Maybe. You know, so each of these things can have slightly different solutions. Okay, there are so many products that we can buy, so many options, so many decisions. All of our homes are different. The way we use energy in our homes is different. So knowing what's best for me in my home, you know, or what's best for society, or what's best for the environment, is it difficult? So to make these decisions, I think we need to be energy literate consumers. What's energy literacy? Or maybe energy literacy is just about knowing how much it costs to boil a kettle you know, when you make a cup of tea. There's more to it. You know, I think being energy literate is about valuing energy. You know? So energy gives us anything, everything that we do. Let's think about it. It gives us warm homes, yes, but it gives us hot showers. It gives us the internet. You know, it allows us to travel. It makes it light when it's dark. So energy allows us to enjoy the remarkable lives that we lead. So being energy literate is about making decisions of our energy use based on the benefits that we get from energy, but also understanding the consequences of energy use. If we don't have energy literacy, how are we supposed to make decisions? You know, we're going to end up making some pretty poor decisions as individuals and as a country. And we might be making inconsistent decisions. But energy literacy isn't really part of the national curriculum. It's not really taught in schools. It's not taught in universities either. And that's a real shame. Because if we don't understand how we use energy in our homes, then I think that as a nation, we're never really going to understand the scale of the problem of getting to net zero homes. So, I'm going to take you all on an energy literacy quest for the next 10 minutes. Okay. I'm not going to tell you about how to save fuel bills. I'm going to share with you a single insight. Okay. I think this insight is going to completely change the way that you think about how we use energy in our homes. Yeah, I think if everybody in the country understood this insight, it has the potential to make or break the UK's attempts to get to net zero. The concept I'm going to talk to you about today is called peak heat. Okay. 
I know what peak oil is, but what's peak heat? Okay, let's discuss that. I'm going to show you the UK's electricity consumption in homes over a year. That's what this is showing. It's quite stable, but there's a little bit of a bump in the middle. That's winter. It's darker. We use our lights more. We stay at home more. So electricity is kind of stable across the UK. That's how we use electricity. This leads to another very common question that I get asked. Surely if we can produce electricity from renewables, it's green, it's carbon free. And if we use this electricity to heat and power our homes, then hey presto, we've got net zero homes and we didn't have to do anything. Do you know what? Yeah, actually there's some truth to this. If a home uses 100% renewable electricity to heat and power it, then we can say that that home is in some ways net zero. But that's one home. For all of our homes in the country, it's not that simple because of peak heat. So we don't use electricity really to heat our homes. Most of us here, we use gas. We've got gas boilers. The 85% of us do. So let's have a look at the UK's gas use in homes over the same period. That's peak heat. Totally different. That's like comparing Mount Everest with the Yorkshire Moors. No comparison. So if we did all have electric boilers in our homes, when we wake up tomorrow morning and our heating kicks in, there'll be a big bang somewhere on the national grid. All the power will go out. You know, we don't have enough electricity. OK, let's illustrate that. Let's put all of that gas use that we're using to heat our homes on top of our existing electricity use. So that's what happens. That's how much electricity we would need. There's just no way we can produce that. We just need more electricity. But we can make more electricity, right? We can just put some more renewables on. Let's do that. Let's show, let's double the number of wind farms in the UK. Let's show how adding more renewables can help solve peak heat. So electricity from wind is about 15 to 50% of the UK's consumption. Okay, so let's add that 15 or 50% extra consumption onto the top of the power that we can give to homes, and let's see how that can help us solve the problem of peak heat. Ah, it did move. I promise it moved. It hasn't really made any difference. Do we expect that? Let's not forget doubling the number of wind farms on our hills and off our shores. That's not easy. It's very expensive to do. And also, if we're going to be using wind power, we don't know that the wind is blowing at the time when we need it, when we've got peak heat. So, right, we've got a problem. We need something that's more powerful and that's reliable. I can think of something, but I don't think you're going to like it. So whatever our personal opinions are, people think that nuclear power is going to be able to provide stable, reliable power to heat our homes and power our homes. OK. Let's do it. Let's just do it for the scenario. Yeah? Let's add another nuclear power station to the amount of electricity that we've got going into our homes. And then we'll be able to see that maybe it's not all bad. You know, maybe it's just we need to accept it because it's going to solve peak heat. So I've added a whole new nuclear power station. And the bar hardly moved. That's the equivalent of another Hinkley Point C power station going into our homes we're still nowhere near being able to support peak heat. So we're just going to have to accept that we're going to need gas in our, to heat our homes in winter. We just can't do it by producing more electricity. So we're never going to get to net zero homes. We're going to have to use gas. Or are we? Now this is where the heat pump comes in. So heat pumps, they still use electricity to provide our heat. Yeah, like our electric boilers that we've pretended are in our homes. The difference is, and a heat pump will give us at least two and a half units of heat for every unit of electricity that we use. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means it's getting some heat for free from the environment. And that means the amount of electricity that we thought we needed isn't going to be anywhere near as big. Let's show you. So we're going to assume that all of these electric boilers in our homes are actually heat pumps. Okay, let's do that. And you'll see what a progress it's going to make towards solving peak heat. Slices our Mount Everest in half. You know, we're making huge strides. Heat pumps in homes is going to be one of the most important things for us to do to achieve net zero and net zero heating in our homes.
but we're not there. Still actually quite a long way away. So even with heat pumps, there's still going to be a residual amount of homes that are going to need to be powered by heat in order for us to provide enough heating in winter to satisfy peak heat. Unless... That can't be it, right? We're not at the end of the talk yet. There's one more scenario. Okay, you've probably heard about this in the news the last couple of years. You know, the government are trying to, allow, trying to make us do this. You know, this is retrofitting our homes, insulating our homes. Okay, so my team, we do research, suggests we could probably reduce the amount of heat demand in homes in half. We'll probably cut it in half. Let's do that. Let's throw another assumption at our energy problems and see if we can drop that peak heat by retrofitting our homes. See what happens. Yeah, we're getting there. We're really getting there. So retrofitting our homes is essential for us to be able to achieve net zero. It doesn't mean we need to retrofit our homes to make heat pumps work. The heat pumps will work in any type of home, with or without insulation. We need insulation and we need to retrofit in order for the grid to work, to help us with our national grid. So that is why we need to retrofit our homes. Problem is, though, retrofitting our homes, buying heat pumps, these are really expensive, very disruptive as well. So in a world where we've got really low levels of energy literacy, in a world where we really don't understand why we need these things, how are we as consumers going to make decisions about what to buy and put in our homes? How is the government going to know how much value to place on these technologies in order to come up with policies that's going to help us with them? So that's why I want everybody in the country to know about peak heat. But we're not actually there yet, are we? We've still got some way to go, and we've made some heroic assumptions in this scenario. So we're going to need complementary solutions, and there are some. So other technical solutions might be that we need house batteries. These batteries can charge up overnight from the national grid when electricity is cheap and abundant, or they could charge up from solar panels on our roofs when the sun's shining. And these batteries would kick in at times of peak heat in our homes. When the national grid is under pressure, the batteries would provide the heating for our houses. Some people think when we all have EVs, electric vehicles, our cars could be our batteries. So we will get used to driving power around with us wherever we go. When we come home, we plug our car into our house, and our car can provide the peak heat boost that we need in our homes that the national grid can't quite cope with. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Other technical solutions you might have heard is hydrogen. So like natural gas, hydrogen is a gas that we can burn to heat our homes. In theory, hydrogen can be produced from renewables. It can be net zero. It can be green. Not at the moment, but maybe in the future. So we could have homes that maybe alongside their heat pump, they also have a hydrogen boiler installed. So at times of peak heat, they have hydrogen piped to their homes instead of natural gas. And when it's cold, they turn on their hydrogen boilers kind of takes the pressure off the grid for the rest of us to use our heat pumps. So that could be a solution too. There's going to be societal solutions. You know, we might just decide to use a little bit less heat. We could turn our thermostats down to 17 or 18, you know, instead of 22 or 23. That would make, that single change would be much more impactful than adding another nuclear power station to our grid. But we don't do it. We could choose to forego using our heat pumps at certain times of the day when there is peak heat. You know, we already see price signals from electricity companies using our smart meters and smart tariffs that encourage us to turn off our appliances at certain times of the day and turn them on at other times of the day when there's more capacity in the grid. You know, it's teaching us to be more flexible with how we use electricity. In theory, energy companies could pay us to not heat our homes when there's peak heat. That could happen. So there's lots of solutions that we could look at, lots of options for us. And with a combination of all of these different things, I'm confident that we do have the techniques and the technologies to achieve net zero homes. Problem is it's going to take a long time. Better levels of energy literacy, that is only going to speed up the journey. We'll get there quicker if we're all more energy literate. Even with that, it's going to take decades before we get there. 
but we have got to the end of our energy literacy quest. So I hope you've enjoyed it. And the next time that someone asks you if you should install a heat pump, you can tell them all about peak heat. Thanks. <laughs>